Five on a Secret Trail by Enid Blyton George was frantic. Timmy, her beloved dog, had tried to jump over a ditch and had caught his ear on a piece of rusty barbed wire. He'd suffered a nasty cut and George couldn't stop the bleeding. Her mother took one look at the cut and told George to take Timmy to the vet at once. George, very anxious indeed, was most relieved to see that the vet seemed quite unconcerned. A couple of stitches and that cut will heal well. Hold him while I do the job. There, old boy. Stand still. That's it. Thank you. I was worried. Will he be all right now? Oh, good gracious, yes. But uh, you mustn't let him scratch the wound. If he does, it may go wrong. But how can I stop him? You must make him a big cardboard collar. One that sticks right out round his neck so that his paw can't get near the cut, however much he tries to reach it. But Timmy won't like that a bit. Well, it's the only way of stopping him from scratching that wound. Now get along now, George. I've got more patients waiting. George went home with Timmy, and her mother helped her to make a big cardboard collar. She fitted it round the surprised Timmy's head, then laced the edges together with thread so that he could not get it off. As soon as the collar was safely round his neck, Timmy tried to scratch his smarting ear. But of course, he couldn't. George was pleased to see that the collar was so successful. But soon her pleasure turned to anger. Everybody who saw poor old Timmy laughed. By the end of the day, George had made up her mind. She would take Timmy camping for a few days to a lonely spot where nobody could see him. So, in the middle of the night, George packed her little tent, a bag of food and other odds and ends. She left a note on the dining room table, then, taking her bike, she rode off, with Timmy trotting beside her. But in the morning, what a disturbance! George's mother found the note and called her husband. Quentin, George has gone and left a note. Let me read it. Uh, uh. Dear Mother, I'm going off for a few days with Timmy till his ear is better. I've taken my tent. Tell Anne to come to the end of Carter's Lane on the Common at twelve, and I will show her where I'm camping. Love, George. Huh. Well, let her stay away if she wants to. Anne can join her. That'll be Anne now. Fanny. Hello, dear. Where's George and Timmy? George has gone off with Timmy. Come in and I'll tell you. Gone off? Why? Poor Timmy has hurt his ear and has to wear a big cardboard collar. Everybody laughs at him and George couldn't bear it any longer. She wants you to go and meet her at 12 o'clock at Carter's Lane. Certainly. I'll go and camp with her for a day or two. How are Julian and Dick? Will they be coming down here at all these holidays? I don't know. They're still in France on a schoolboy's tour. At twelve o'clock, Anne was standing at the end of Carter's Lane with her belongings strapped to her back and a bag in her hand. Suddenly she heard a hissing sound. Anne! George, where are you? I'm coming out. I hid in the bush in case my parents came and tried to make me go back. Hello, Timmy, darling. How's your poor old ear? I'm glad you've come, Anne. Let's go. I've got a lovely camping place. It's near a little spring, so there's plenty of water. Did you bring any more food? Oh, yes. Heaps. Aunt Fanny made me. This is going to be fun. Timmy's ear will soon be better. It doesn't stop him chasing rabbits. Look at him. When are Julian and Dick coming down? 
They may not be coming down at all, these holes. Not coming? But they always come. Or we go away somewhere together. Well, they're still in France. We'll hear if they're coming down to Kieran when we eventually get back to the cottage. We shan't have any adventures at all if the boys don't come. Why, we shan't be the five. The famous five, if they don't come. I knew you'd say that. Are we getting near this place of yours, George? Yes. You see that cottage? It's near there. Does anyone live there? No, it's quite ruined and empty. Oh, my word, it's hot. Is there anywhere to bathe near here? I don't know. We could explore and see. Oh, here's your tent. Thank goodness. This bag of food is heavy. Let's have some now. I'm starving. Here, Timmy. I brought some dog biscuits for you. Mmm. These sandwiches are good. Where's Timmy going? For a drink, I expect. The spring is the way he's gone. I'm thirsty, too. Let's take a mug and get a drink ourselves. Here's the spring. It's delicious. What's that noise? I can't imagine. Here's Timmy. He's got a bone. It's a good meaty one. Do you suppose someone is camping near us and Timmy has stolen it from another dog? Come on, Anne. Let's do a bit of exploring and find out. <laughs> That's right, Timmy. Bury that bone first. The two girls, with Timmy at their heels, left their camping place and set off. Anne caught sight of the ruined cottage and suggested they have a look at it. They went in through a stone archway from which the door was missing. Inside was a big room the floor of which was paved with slabs of white stone, grass and weeds growing up in the cracks between them. A small stairway of stone led to the rooms upstairs. Outside in the yard, Anne was excited. You know, George, this old place has got a nice feel about it. I can almost hear hens clucking and ducks quacking. <laughs> what was that? It sounded like hens and ducks, but there aren't any here. We shall hear a horse whinnying next. Where's Timmy gone? There must be hens near. Come round the back of these stables and look. Timmy, where are you? Timmy! Timmy! Did you whistle, Anne? No. Oh, it's all very odd. Let's go back to our camp. Good idea. Come on, Timmy. Now what's he doing? Crawling under that gorse bush. Timmy, you can't get under there with that collar. Oh, look, George. There's another little black and white dog following him out. Poor little thing, he's only got one eye. Well, what's that dog doing there? This is all very peculiar. I shall expect to see Timmy bring us a cat next. Hold the dogs, Anne. I'm going into the undergrowth to find that cat. You came out in a hurry, George. What is it? There's an idiot of a boy in there who's doing the mewing. Come out and let's see you. Hello, girls. Hello there, Tim. How does my dog know you? He came growling at me yesterday in my camp, and I offered him a nice juicy bone. I thought I'd rather he ate the bone than me. And you did all the clucking and quacking, I suppose. What are you doing? I'm digging. My father's an archaeologist, and I take after him, I suppose. There was an old Roman camp on this common, and I found a place where part of it must have been. I found this coin yesterday. Look at the date on it. It looks like 292. Yes, that's what I think. So the camp's pretty old, isn't it? We'll come and see it. No, don't. I don't like people messing around me when I'm doing something serious. Please don't come. I won't bother you again, I promise. All right, we won't come. Thanks. Well, I'm off. Come on, Jet. So long. When they had finished eating tea, the girls decided to go for a walk. In the distance, 
they could hear the sharp metallic noises of the boy working. Because of their promise not to disturb him, they went off in the opposite direction. They had a lovely walk, and as they came back near to their camp, they heard the sound of low whistling. They came round a big gorse bush and almost bumped into the boy. Why, it's you! What are you doing here? You said you wouldn't come near us. I said nothing of the sort. Oh, you did? Well, if you break your promise, we shall come and visit your camp. I never made you any promise. You're mad. Oh, don't be an idiot. I suppose you'll be saying next that you didn't act like a hen and a duck and a horse this afternoon. And a cat. Barmy. Quite barmy. Are you coming here again? If I want to. Then we shall come and explore your camp. By all means come if you want to, but don't bring your dog. He might eat mine. You know he wouldn't eat yet. They're good friends. I don't know anything of the sort. Well, I'm off. What do you make of that? Very odd. He was so full of fun before, but just now he seemed quite serious. Oh, well, perhaps he's a bit crazy. Are you sleepy, Anne? Oh, oh not very, but I'd like to lie down on this springy heather. I don't think I'll sleep in that tent, George. It's so small. I'll sleep in the open air as well. Let's make a heather mattress and put a rug on top of it. Soon the two girls were asleep, with Timmy snuggled up against George. Anne didn't quite know why she awoke, but she knew she was very thirsty. Quietly she got up and went to the little spring and drank from her cupped hands. On her way back, she stopped. Was she going in the right direction? She wasn't sure. Suddenly she saw a light. It flashed and disappeared. She strained her eyes and saw that she had taken the wrong way. The light came from the ruined cottage. Now she could hear sounds, whispering sounds, and the noise of a footfall on the stone floor of the cottage. As fast and as silently as she could, she made her way back to the camp. George, wake up! I have something strange to tell you. Whatever is it, Anne? There's someone in that old cottage. I went to the spring for a drink and saw a light in the cottage and I heard voices. Timmy, we'll go and do a little exploring. Come on and keep quiet. There's the cottage. I can't see any sign of a light. Can't hear a thing. They must have gone. Unless you dreamed it, Anne. I didn't. Let's send Timmy into the cottage. He'll soon bark if there's anyone there. All right. Go on, Timmy. Find, Timmy, find. <coughs> you can hear him pattering about in there. Well, there can't be anyone in there, else Timmy would have sniffed them out. You dreamt it all, Anne. I did not. I know there were people there. Timmy, come along. We've sent you on a wild goose chase, but now we'll go back to bed. When Anne woke in the morning, she too began to wonder if she had dreamed what she had seen and heard in the old cottage. After breakfast, George suggested that they go and see the boy in his camp. They heard a chip chipping noise as they came near and then something small and hairy shot out from a bush and rushed up, barking a welcome. Hello, Jet. You two, you promised not to come and disturb me, just like girls to break a promise. It was you who broke yours. Who came messing around our camp yesterday evening, I'd like to know? Not me. I always keep my promises. Now go away and keep yours. We're going. We don't want to see anything of your silly digging. Goodbye. Goodbye and good riddance. Let's go back this way. Come on, Timmy. He's quite mad. First he makes a promise, then last evening he broke it. Now he says he kept it. Anne, look. He's there, sitting reading. It's amazing. Another little trick of yours, I suppose. You must be a jolly good runner to have got here so quickly. Oh, no, it's those potty girls again. How did 
you get here so quickly? I didn't get here quickly. I came very slowly, reading my book. Fibber! It's only a minute or so ago we talked to you. You're idiots! Do go away! And you shut up too. <sighs> Come on, we'll never get any sense out of him. The two girls walked off together, quite perplexed by the behaviour of the boy. By now, their stock of food was running low, and that afternoon they decided that they would have to go to Kirin Cottage for more. George's mother had some wonderful news. Julian and Dick were back from France and would soon be with them. George was delighted. The five would be together again. It was growing dark when they got back to their camp again, as they had stayed to have a good meal at Kirin Cottage. They settled down on their heather mattress and were soon asleep. Next day, the girls were very cheerful. They made a good breakfast, then put on their swimsuits and went off for a swim to a pool they had found. On the way, they saw Jet in the distance and the boy with him. Don't worry, I'm not going near your place. I'm still keeping my promise. Ignore him, Anne. I will. Oh, George, look. There's somebody swimming in the pool. Who is it? Anne? It's that boy, but... But, but we've just seen him going in the opposite direction. How extraordinary. No, it can't be the boy. It is. I'm just getting out. I shall be in a minute. How did you get here? We never saw you turn and run back. I've been here for 15 minutes. Fibber? Oh, balmy as usual. Same as yesterday. Cheerio. Oh, come on, Anne, let's swim. I must say, that boy is odd. I suppose he thinks it's funny to meet people, then double back and meet them again. I just don't understand him. They had a long swim, got out and basked in the sun. Then they began to feel hungry and went back to their little camping place. The day passed quickly and they saw no more of the puzzling boy or Jet. When they settled down on their heather bed that night, there were no stars twinkling above them. Instead, there were rather heavy clouds. It was a crash of thunder that woke them, and soon large raindrops were peppering their faces. Lo, a thunderstorm! We'll be soaked! Better get in the tent. No good. It's soaked already. Let's grab some bedding and go to the cottage. Come on! Run! <sighs> well, for a ruin, it's pretty dry in here. Let's settle down in this corner. It's away from that broken window. The rain's stopping. I think the storm has passed. We can't go back to the tent. We'll have to stay here and try to get some sleep. Oh, blow that storm. Well, good night. <coughs> Timmy, what's the matter? George, hold his collar. Don't let him leave us. <coughs> I've got him. What is it? I don't know. We'll keep awake a bit and see if we hear anything peculiar. It's all right, Anne. It must have been the thunderstorm that upset him. Oh, it sounds as if the storm is coming back. Where are you going? To look out of the window. I like to see the countryside lit up in a lightning flash. Oh, George! Whatever's the matter? There's someone out there! People! I saw them just for an instant when the lightning flashed. How many? I, I think there were two or maybe three. What are people doing out there in this storm? Oh, I'm frightened. Don't worry, Anne. It's the easiest thing in the world to imagine seeing things in a lightning flash. Timmy would bark if there were people around. Well, he did bark, didn't he? Ah, yes. But that was just because he heard the storm coming up again. Oh, Anne, you're right. A face looked 
in at the window. And if we saw him, he must have seen us. Whatever's he doing here in the middle of the night? I expect it was one of the people I saw. Maybe. But what in the world is anyone doing wandering about here at night? I wish the boys were here. They'd know what to do. Well, the storm's going off again, thank goodness. I can't possibly go to sleep again. Let's play some silly games to take our minds off it. So they played the alphabet game, each trying to think of an animal for each letter of the alphabet. By the time they got to M, Anne was two marks ahead and dawn was breaking. They immediately felt much better, but very tired. They cuddled down on the rug together and soon fell asleep. They were awakened by something scuttling round them, making a very loud noise. Then Timmy barked. Oh, it's Jet! Hello, sleepyheads. I came to see if you were all right after that awful storm. I felt a bit worried about you. Oh, that's nice of you. Wasn't it a dreadful storm? How did you get on? All right. I sleep down in the trench. And the rain can't get at me. Well, so long. Come on, Jack. That was nice of him. He doesn't seem crazy this morning, does he? He's coming back again. Good morning. I just wondered if you were all right after the storm. You know jolly well we're all right. We've already told you. You haven't? And I didn't know. Sorry to see you're still balmy. Goodbye. I suppose he thinks that's funny, silly ass. The girls made up their minds to go back to Kirin Cottage. By the time they had dried their things and were ready to go, it was half past twelve. Suddenly, Timmy went quite mad. He barked wildly and set off down a path at top speed. Wonder of wonders, it was Julian and Dick. There they came, packs on their backs, grinning all over their faces. Julian, Dick, we never guessed you'd come so soon. We got fed up with French food, and it was so hot. We kept on thinking of Kirin and the bay, and you two girls and Timmy. So we packed up before we should and flew home. Did you come straight here? We spent the night with Mother and Dad at home, then caught the first train we could this morning only to find you weren't at Kirin. So we packed camping things in smaller bags and came straight along to you. Poor old Timmy looks a scream in his collar. <laughs> yes, he does look funny, doesn't he? But he doesn't mind a bit. You two seem to be packing up. What's happened? Anne was certain there was something funny going on here and we didn't feel we could tackle it ourselves. What do you mean, something funny? Well, you see... It began like this. If there's a tale to tell, let's have it over a meal, shall we? We've had nothing to eat since six o'clock this morning. We're ravenous. As they ate, the two girls told the boys everything. All about the ruined cottage, the strange boy, the one-eyed dog, the Roman remains, the storm, and the mysterious strangers. Julian and Dick listened intently. They were both intrigued by the story. Most interesting. I wonder you two didn't pack up and go home at once. You must be braver without us than I thought possible. Well, I did tell George I was going home this very morning. I was so scared last night. George didn't want to, of course, but she was coming all the same. But now you've turned up, things are different. Ah, well, do we stay on or don't we, Julian? Are we scared or are we not? Well, if you go back... I shall stay on alone, just to show you. Good old Anne. We shall stay, of course. You girls unpack again, and we'd better unpack too, Julian. Where shall we put our things? I don't somehow like to leave everything in that little tent with a mad boy and a one-eyed dog about. Let's put everything in the cottage, shall we? Move in properly, in case it rains again at night. Good idea. Come on, everyone. As soon as we've done that, we'll go and see the Roman remains. And the mad boy. The famous five are off again, and who knows what will happen. When they had finished putting their things in the cottage, the five set off for the Roman campsite. 
As they neared the old camp, they saw a boy sitting beside a bush reading. There's the boy we told you about. He looks fairly ordinary. Hello, where's Jet? How do I know? Well, he was with you this morning. He was not. He's never with me. Now push off. There you are. We saw him this morning with Jet. Now he says the dog is never with him. Quite mad. Or plain rude. It's not too far now. I can hear someone whistling coming from that trench there. Let me see. I can't believe it. How did you get here? I've been down here all the afternoon. Fibber. I'm tired of you two girls. And now you've brought your friends as well to aggravate me even more. Don't be an idiot. Is this Roman camp your property? No, it was discovered by my father some time ago. See my finds? I'll jump down. I say, you've certainly got some wonderful things here. Any coins? Yes, three. Look, hundreds of years old. Can we all come down? Yes, all right. While you do, George, I'm going to have a look at those rocks over there. Okay. Oh, look, there's another shelf with things on it. Are these yours too? No, nothing to do with me. Don't touch them, please. I just want to have a look at this beautiful little pot. Hey, I told you not to touch those. Put it back. Easy, old man. No need to yell at her like that. Well, I don't like being disturbed too much. People always seem to be wandering around. What kind of people? Oh, nosy ones, wanting to get down here and explore. Was anyone about last night? I think so, because Jet here barked like mad. I say, there's a most interesting large hole behind that stone slab over there. What is it? My father says it was only a place for storage. Nothing interesting was found there. Uh, what's your name? Guy Laudler. My word. Is your father the famous explorer, Sir John Laudler? Yes. No wonder you're so keen on archaeology. Come on, Dick. Let's go now. Right. Come on, Julian. Goodbye, Guy. They went back to the old cottage and decided to explore it thoroughly, upstairs and down. There was nothing much of interest inside, and they went into the yard to have a look at the outbuildings. They examined everything, and came last of all to the old stables, floored out with white flagstones. I say, there's something funny here. Anne, look, this bit of floor was undisturbed yesterday, wasn't it? Yes, you can see that stone has been moved since then. I bet something's buried underneath. Those men last night, that's what they came about. They lifted this stone. Why? We'll soon find out. Come on, everyone. Loosen it with your fingers. Then we'll heave it up. <laughs> oh, really there. Help me this side, Dick. He... <sighs> <sighs> Nothing. Not even a hole. Well, it's clear that whoever was here didn't find anything. Nor did he hide anything either. The wrong stone, probably. Yes, I think Anne's right. Probably there is something interesting under the right stone, but which one is it? From what Anne told us about seeing the light in the cottage and hearing voices, then the people are outside in the storm, it looks as if someone is urgently hunting for something round here. Perhaps it's something valuable that's been stolen. Maybe. We can't tell. I wonder if the people that bothered Guy are anything to do with this. They may have been. But they've clearly decided that what they're looking for is here. They must have been annoyed to find you and Anne here last night, George. I don't know whether I want to stay here now. They'll probably come back again. Who cares? We've got Timmy, haven't we? Let's stay on. We'll do a bit of pulling up stones ourselves. We might find something very interesting. All right, I'll stay. Let's go outside and see if there are any footprints about. It was very muddy in the rain last night. Good idea. This is where the man who looked in the window stood. Look, two footprints. One of them perfectly clear. 
I've got some paper. I'll measure it first. Hmm. Um. Size eight. Now I'll just draw the pattern on the sole and the heel. You're quite a detective, Dick. Oh, anyone can copy footprints. The thing is to match them up with the owner. By now it was getting dark. The five had a snack for supper, then started getting ready for bed. Before long, they were all asleep. Timmy was asleep too, with one ear open as usual. A weird noise suddenly made him sit up. He poured George to wake her. Oh, Timmy, do stop! Whatever's that? Julian, Dick, wake up! Something's happening. There are odd lights outside the window. Look, they're up in the air. Blue, green. That round white one is floating about. What's happening, Julian? It's very strange. I'll go out with Timmy and see what I can find. Oh, do be careful, Julian. Here, Timmy. Come on. Julian, come back. He's coming. What was it, Julian? I don't know. I simply don't know. Perhaps we can find out in the morning. I want to go back to Kieran. I don't like this. I understand how you feel, Anne. I didn't see a thing just now. Timmy barked and ran around, but there didn't seem to be anyone there. Did you get near the lights? Yes, fairly near. They were up in the air, and again, Timmy couldn't find anyone. He would have found them if anyone could. <coughs> There's one idea in my mind I'd like to sort out tomorrow. What's that? Maybe somebody badly wants us out of here. So that he can make a thorough search, so he's trying to frighten us out. Yes, I believe you're right. Let's have a good snoop around in daylight. Yes, we will. It took the four children a long time to go to sleep after all this excitement. Eventually, they did fall asleep, and ended up sleeping late. Julian woke first the next morning. He roused the others and suggested a swim in the pool to freshen themselves up before breakfast. They set off happily in the warm sunshine, and when they got to the pool, they saw the boy there floating on his back. There's Guy. Hello. Come on in. It's fine. Is your name Guy this morning or not? Of course it's Guy. Don't be idiotic. Come on in and have a game. Come on, race your dad! Come on! I've had enough. Let's go out and sit in the sun. Good idea. Guy, did you see or hear anything strange last night? I didn't see anything strange, but I thought I heard wailing and crying in the distance. We heard it too. Quite near us, and saw strange lights. How weird! It was. Let's go back to the cottage. I'm getting hungry. Right. Goodbye, guy. See you sometime soon. They walked back to the cottage and had a good breakfast. Then went outside to see if they could find anything to explain the strange happenings of the night before. The noises seemed to come from about here last night. And the light started about here too, high up above the ground. Above your head? That seems odd. It doesn't. What about those trees? 
Couldn't somebody climb up them and do the wailing and whining there and set off weird lights? Anne's got it. Clever girl. It explains why Timmy didn't find anyone too. They were up trees. Look at this. A wrinkled rubber skin. Pale green. That's what those lights were. Balloons. Lit up from the inside in some way and sent floating in the air. Most ingenious. They certainly meant to scare us away. Well, they won't. I won't be scared away by stupid tricks. Good old Anne. Right. We'll all stay. But I've got an idea. What? We'll pretend to go. We'll pack up everything and go and camp somewhere else. Dick and I will hide somewhere here tonight and watch to see if anyone comes. That's a fantastic plan. We'll be ready for them. The five spent quite a pleasant day. But when late afternoon came, they decided it was time to carry out their plan and pack as if they were leaving. It was Dick who spotted the little flash of light made by the sun on glass. Someone at the top of a nearby hill was watching them through field glasses. They went on with their packing and soon began to stagger out with their bundles. Just then a countrywoman came hurrying along. She stopped when she saw the five. Good afternoon. Isn't it glorious weather? Beautiful. Are you camping out? No, actually, we've been sleeping in the old cottage, but we've decided to move out. Is it very old? Oh, yes, and it's supposed to have strange things happening in it at night. We know that. We were pretty scared last night, I can tell you. Weird noises and horrible ghostly lights. We decided not to stay any longer. That's right. Don't you stay. You get as far from this place as you can. Where are you going? Well, our home's at Kirin. A fine place. Well, don't you stay another night. Goodbye. Julian, why did you tell all that to the woman? Anne, did you really think that woman was what she pretended to be? A woman from a nearby farm? Well, wasn't she? She looked like one. Anne, farm women don't have gold fillings in their teeth. And what about her hands? A farmer's wife's hands would be rough and brown. That woman's hands were as white as a princess. Well, yes, I did notice them. There you are. She's one of the unpleasant gang that tried to scare us last night. No doubt the watcher on the hill sent her to make sure we were going. You certainly fooled her, Julian. The gang will be down here tonight for sure. Now come on, and we'll make a new camp, somewhere that won't be easily seen. I know a good place. There's a huge gorse bush on the other side of the spring. Underneath it's all hollow. It's almost like a gorse cave. They found George's place, and it was ideal, except for one thing. Poor old Timmy had trouble getting in and out because of his collar. George carefully examined his ear and decided the collar could come off at last. Timmy was delighted. It was getting dark and under the gorse bush it was very dark indeed. As soon as they had finished supper, Julian and Dick agreed it was time for them to go and keep watch at the old cottage. They approached the cottage very cautiously, and decided that the best place to hide would be in the upstairs rooms. Up the little stone staircase they went, and settled themselves down on a low broken wall. The boys had been there for about three quarters of an hour when Julian gave Dick a slight nudge. Here they come. See, over there. A torch. And another. And another. Quite a procession. They're splitting up, having a good look round to see if we really are gone. Hope they don't think of coming up here. Let's get behind the chimney, in case... Someone is coming up. Shh. There's no one up here. The kids have gone. We can get on with the job. Where do we start? Here, Jess, where's the plane? I've got it. I'll spread it on the floor. Not that it's much use. Paul's no good at drawing. Dick, I know that voice. 
It's the woman from this afternoon. All we know for certain is that we have to find a white stone slab. And we know the size, but we don't know the place. Except we think it must be here. I mean, we've searched the old Roman camp and there are no slabs there that size. They are the visitors Guy complained about. If we have to get up every slab in this neighbourhood, we will. If we don't find those blueprints, we might as well go in a poor house for the rest of our lives. Or prison? Nah, not prison. It'll be Paul who goes to prison. He stole them, we didn't. Can't you get Paul to draw a better plan than this? I can't understand half of what's written here. Well, it's no good asking him, he's ill. He had such a time escaping with those plans, he nearly died. I can't make out this word here. W-A-D-E-R? Whatever does it mean? Oh, I don't know. Oh, wait, though, I do. W-A-T-E-R. Water. That's a T, not a D in the middle. Oh, where's the well? Anywhere in this kitchen? Water. I bet there's a slab over the well. That's the way to the secret hiding place. This is getting exciting, Dick. Here's the old sink. And the remains of a pump. The well's underneath this slab. It's just about the right size. Get busy. Come on. Oh, let me that, Jimmy Tom. You're not doing much good with it. Yeah, up she comes. Blimey. Well, is it a well down there? Here, give me that torch, Jess. Yes, it is. My, the water's pretty far down. This is no secret way. It's just an ordinary well. The word can't have meant water. All right, boss, what does it mean then? This isn't a plan, it's a riddle. Why couldn't Paul have made it clear where the stone slab is? All we can make out is that it's on this common, somewhere near here, and the secret way is behind the slab. Oh, I'm fed up. We've lifted slabs in that camp, we've lifted some here, and we still don't know if we're anywhere near the right one. Oh, shut up. If we have to lift every slab there is, we'll do it. Now, finding the blueprints makes all the difference between wealth and poverty. Now, anyone who wants to back out can do so, but he'd better be careful. Now, boss... We're all in this together. We'll do all you say. We can start by lifting any slabs the size that Paul figured on this plan. Oh, you're right then. Then if we don't find it here, we'll have to search a camp again. That's going to be difficult with somebody already there. Then we'll deal with him. Right, let's get started. Then began a boring time for the two hidden boys, as slab after slab was lifted and put back. At last... The searchers left the cottage and went off together. Before the boys left, Julian measured the size of the slab from over the well. It could be useful to know the size of the slab they were looking for. They hurried back to the gorse bush camp and heard a welcome bark from Timmy. Both girls were awake and refused to go to sleep until the boys had told them everything. It was late when they awoke next morning and they hurried over to the Roman camp to warn Guy. As they came near to the camp, they stopped in amazement. Someone was howling broken-heartedly down in the trench. Guy! Whatever's happened? It's Guy! He's gone! They've taken him, and I was so awful to him. But... but your Guy... I'm not, Guy. He's my twin. There are two of us. Twins? We thought there was only one of you. You were never together. No, we quarrelled bitterly. We hated one another then. We really did. I just pretended Guy didn't exist, and he did the same. What's happened to make you so upset? Guy wanted to be friends with me again last night, and I wouldn't. I hit him and walked away. This morning I was sorry and went to find him and be friends and... Well, go on, tell us. I was just in time to see him fighting two men, screaming and kicking. Then they hustled him away somewhere. 
I fell down the trench and hurt my leg and couldn't get out to help him. I'll never forgive myself, never. Let me look at your leg. I'll bind it up for you. I think we know what's happened, don't we, Julian? How do you know what's happened? Can you get Guy back? We'll certainly do our best. My name's Harry Lordler, and Guy and I are mad about old camps and buildings. Yes, Guy told us. But he never said anything about you. We thought you and he were one boy. You're identical. Can you tell us a bit about the people that Guy was fighting? Yes, they were some that came before, wanting Guy to clear out while they had a look around. Guy was pretty rude to them. Let's have a hunt round. We might find something. But I imagine the searchers have taken Guy off with them because he knew too much. Perhaps they found what they were looking for and saw Guy watching. Oh no, he's not kidnapped, is he? Don't say that. Come on, let's have a hunt. They all made their way among the various trenches and pits, looking for they hardly knew what. They gave it up after a while. There were too many slabs and stones of all sizes. Julian decided that the only thing they could do would be to go back to their camp, have a quick bite to eat, then go back to Kirin with Harry and tell the police all they knew. When they had finished eating, George went to the spring with a tin to get some water for them to drink. As she idly held the tin in the gurgling water jetting up from the stony slabs, she had a sudden thought. Water? Stone slabs? What had Dick and Julian said about the plan? Water. Could one of these slabs be the one? She rushed back to the others at full speed. Julian, I believe I've found the slab. What do you mean, George? Show me. Come to the spring. Come on, everyone. There. That slab's about the right size, isn't it? And it's beside water. Just as it said in the plan you told us about. Gosh, I wonder if you're right, George. Sometimes springs come from underground passages. Let's try and move it. It looks pretty hefty to me. I'll go and get some of my tools. We can easily move it if we have the right tools. Be quick, Harry. Let's clear some of the earth away while he's gone. <coughs> Here comes Harry. This big crowbar should do the trick. Give me a hand. Right. Together. Heave! Yeah. It's coming away. Look out. It's going to fall in the spring. Yes. I think we've got it. There's a tunnel behind going down and down. We'll have to make the opening a bit wider. Earth and roots have narrowed it. Let's make it bigger. Then we'll explore it. A secret tunnel known only to us. Right. Let's widen the hole. Harry, give me something to dig with. This won't take a minute. <laughs> there, it's done. I'll get in first. Everyone got torches? Come on, then. Once they were all in, they walked in single file, holding the shirt of the one in front. All except Timmy, of course. The tunnel wound about a good deal, and then, unexpectedly, the rather soft ground they were treading on turned into rock. The tunnel ended suddenly, and they found themselves in a big cave with a high roof. Is this where we have to look for whatever's hidden, I wonder? Let's have a look around the cave and see if there are any exits. I found another tunnel over here. There's one here as well. Now, which one do we take? Would that pole fellow have marked the correct tunnel in any way? Possibly. Let's look for some sort of sign. It's all right. This passage I've found has an arrow drawn in white chalk on the wall. Good. This must be the way. Come on. Anyone got any idea in which direction we're going? Hang on. I've got a pocket compass. Hmm, I think we're going in the direction of the Roman camp. Oh, oh no, we've come up against a blank wall. We can't go any further. Oh. 
We must be able to, surely. Shine your torches around everyone, up and down as well. Hey, you're right, Dick. There's a hole above my head. Is there a white arrow anywhere? Um, yes, and it's pointing upwards. We've got to go upwards, but how? Oh, look! There are rough natural steps up, made by ledges of rock. Yes, we can manage to get up quite easily. George, you go first. I'll give you a boost up. Uh, okay, hang on. Let me get part of the way up. Uh, right. Push now. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, I'm through the hole. It's a small cave up here. I believe this is the place where those things are hidden. I can see something on a ledge. Do buck up. Out of my way, George. Let me through. Come on, Anne. Give me your hand. Oh, thanks, Dick. Here's Timmy. Someone take him from me. That was an easy climb up. Guy and I do that sort of thing all the time. Right. George, where's that ledge? There, see? It looks like a brown leather bag on it. Yes. My word, I hope there's something in it. It feels very light. Open it, Julian. I can't. It's locked and we haven't got a key. So we don't know if it's got anything of value in it or not. Can we cut it open? No, I don't think so. It's made of really strong leather. We would need a special knife. I think we'll just have to assume we've got the goods and hope for the best. Well, what do we do now? Go back through that tunnel? Yes, I suppose so. Wait! Look, what do all those arrows on the wall mean? There's a line of them to the edge of the hole we came up. And another line of arrows pointing the other way. Perhaps there's another way out. Where's Timmy? Has he fallen down the hole? Timmy? Timmy, where are you? Timmy? Where is he? It didn't sound as if that bark came from down below. Here he is. Timmy, where have you just come from? Oh, what idiots we are. Just behind this big jutting out piece of rock, there's another passage. That second row of arrows pointing to it. It's a pretty narrow opening. It'll be difficult to squeeze through. Well, what about trying? It might be a shorter way out. It won't be longer. By my reckoning, we must be pretty near the camp now. Though where it comes out, I can't imagine. Harry, would this lead to that enormous hole underground? The one guy told me had been explored, but was of no interest. Probably just an old store place. Yes, I think you might be right, Dick. Then come on, let's find out. They all squeezed through the hole with great difficulty. The passage grew wider immediately. It ran fairly straight, and then went steeply downwards and came to a complete stop. This time it was not a blank wall of rock that faced them. It was something else. A roof full. Now we're done for. We'd better turn back. There's nothing else for it, I'm afraid. Come on, Timmy. <coughs> Timmy, what is it? <coughs> Timmy, what on earth's the matter? He's digging like mad. There's something or somebody behind this roof full. Stop him barking, George, and let's see if we can hear anything. Timmy, that's enough. Stop barking. <coughs> It's Jet! Guy must be with him! Jet! Guy! Jet! If we can hear Jet barking, this roof full can't be very big. Let's clear a way through. Uh, 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 Watch out! It's sliding! That's made a gap at the top. Jet! He's coming through the hole! Oh, Jet! Where's Guy? Guy! Are you there? Yes. Who's that? It's us and Harry. We're coming to you. Right, everyone. Through we go. Be careful. Uh, you can uh, stop it. Okay. Um, okay. Are you all right? Right? Uh, 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 Hello. I'm jolly glad to see you. I'm all right. It's just my ankle. Oh, Guy. Are you really all right? We are friends again, aren't we? Of course we are, Harry. You must be starving. Here. Have some chocolate. 
Now, Guy, tell us what happened. Guy soon told his story. It was much as the others had imagined. Jet had woken him that morning by barking, and Guy had seen some people looking all over the place. He'd yelled at them, but they'd only laughed. Then one of the men found the entrance to the big hole. It was obvious that they had thought that if they left Guy behind, he might fetch help. So they had grabbed him and taken him with them. They'd lowered themselves down the hole by rope and had made Guy go down too. He'd fallen off halfway down, hurt his ankle, and fainted. When he came to, they were by the roof fall. He assumed the men must have dragged him along with them. And that's all, is it? Not quite. They were furious when they saw the roof fall, and they've gone off to get some tools to dig through it. Good gracious! Then they may be back at any moment. I suppose so. Is it very far to the opening you came down? I don't know. I'd fainted, remember? It can't be far. I think it would be worth trying to find the opening to see if the men have left the rope there and get out that way. That's what we'll do then. Let me have a look at your ankle, Guy. I've done my first aid training, so I ought to know if it's broken or not. Oh, ow, sorry.、Um, no, I'm pretty sure it's not. I'll bandage it tightly with a couple of handkerchiefs. Give me yours, Dick. Here you are. I'll try to be as gentle as possible, but I've got to make it tight. Uh, there. Stand up and see how that feels. Ow. Ow. Uh, uh, got you. It's, it's fine. Come on, let's go. We don't want to bump into those fellows if we can help. That wasn't far. Here's the pit. Gosh, it's huge. I can see daylight in the roof. That's the opening we came down. The rope's still there. Can you manage to climb up that rope, Anne? Of course. We do rope climbing in the gym at school, don't we, George? Right. Up you go, George. George went up like a monkey, and Anne followed suit. Guy managed the rope with some difficulty, helped by Harry. Then Jet and Timmy were hauled up, tied up in the boys' shirts. Soon everyone was in the open air at long last. Julian had the precious bag safely under his arm. Timmy sat down, panting. Then suddenly he stopped panting and pricked up his ears. Quiet, Timmy! Hide everyone quickly! It must be those fellows coming back. Here's a good place, Anne. Here, Guy. I'll give you a hand. Everyone's hidden, Julian. Good. Quiet now. Oh, what a time we've been!、Ah, here, just chuck the spades and things down the hole. Right, down the rope, Tom. Come on, buck up! We've wasted too much time already. Okay. Right, stand clear. I'm coming down. Right, everyone, back to the camp. Hurry! They all shot out of their hiding places and made off to their camp, except Julian. He hauled the rope up from the hole and wound it round his waist. Then he went after the others, grinning widely. Julian, here you are at last. What were you doing? Oh, just hauling up the rope. Look, I've brought it with me. That's brilliant. Now they'll be trapped down there. What are we going to do about Guy? He can't walk far on that bad foot. I've got my bike here. He could pedal with one foot, I should think. Oh yes, I could easily do that. Right, let's make our way back to Kirin. We'll ring the police and ask them if they'll come along and collect this bag from us. I want to see it opened in front of us. They crossed the common, went down Carter's Lane, and got back to Kirin Cottage at last. The front door was open, and as they went in, George yelled for her mother. Nobody answered. And George yelled again. The study door opened, and her father looked out, red in the face and frowning. George, how many times must I tell you not to shout while I'm working? Where's Mother?、Uh, we've just had an adventure, and we want to tell her. Oh, and we want to ring the police and get a doctor to see Guy's foot. Bless us all! There's never any peace when you're about George. Your mother's at the bottom of the garden. We won't disturb you any more, Uncle. We'll go and find Aunt Fanny. 
Good. This way. There's Aunt Fanny. Hello. I thought you wanted to stay away for longer than this. We did, but an adventure descended on us. Just now we want two things. Can we ring the police and ask them to come here? There's something important for them to know. And also, do you think we should let a doctor see Guy's foot? He sprained his ankle. Let me have a look. Right, I'll go and ring the police. Oh dear. Yes, Guy, that foot is very swollen. You must have it seen to properly. Let's go inside and I'll ring the doctor. Ah, there you are. I've just spoken to the police. The inspector himself is coming. He's on his way. Would you ring the doctor, please, Julian? His number's on the pad by the phone. Yes, certainly. How did you get such an ankle, Guy? Mother, you don't seem at all interested in our adventure. Oh, I am, dear. But you do have such a lot, you know. That must be the police already. Who's hammering on the door like that? What's the matter? I've a good mind to report you to the police. Uh, ah, um, good, uh, good afternoon, Inspector. Uh, do come in. Uh, are we expecting you? Good afternoon, sir. I asked the Inspector to come, Uncle Quentin. Uh, very well. Uh, I'll leave you to it. You wanted me to come along at once because of something important. What is it? This brown leather bag. Quite a lot of people were looking for it, but we managed to get hold of it first. What's inside? Stolen goods? Yes, blueprints of some kind, we think. Open the bag, my boy, and I'll examine them. I can't open it. It's locked, and there's no key. We'll soon manage that. This gadget will do it. There. Ah. There's nothing in here. No wonder it felt so light. It's empty after all. Would you believe it? Where did you get this bag? What made you think it had stolen blueprints inside? Well, it's rather a long story. You'll have to tell it to me. Julian began the story, making it as clear and short as he could. The inspector became more and more interested. He listened to the tale of the underground passages and picked up the bag again. He shook the bag hard. Then he began to examine it very carefully. Finally, he took out a sharp knife and gently slit the lining at the bottom of the bag. Something was there, under the lining. So the bag's not empty, after all. It's a blueprint of some project. But what? My father would know. He's a scientist, Inspector. Shall I get him? Yes, do. Here's my father. Sorry to disturb you, sir, but do you happen to know whether this document is of any importance? Why, why, no. It's impossible. Good heavens, am I dreaming? It's important, then, is it? Important? There are only two of these prints in existence, and at the moment I have the second one. Where did this come from? Sir James Lawton Harrison has the other. There isn't a third. But there must be, if you have one here, and Sir James has the other. It's obvious there is a third. It isn't obvious. What is obvious is that Sir James hasn't got his. I'll ring him at once. Well, you children... It looks as if you've stumbled on something pretty important. Yes, Sir James's copy has been stolen, but it's been kept very hush-hush because of its importance. Father, what is this a blueprint of? This blueprint? I'm certainly not going to tell you, or the inspector either, for that matter. It's one of the biggest secrets we have. Here, give it to me. No. I think I must take it and send it to Sir James by secret messenger. Your house might catch fire and both prints might go up in flames. Oh, I'll take it then. We can't possibly risk such a thing. I still don't understand how you children came to possess it. Listen to their tale. They haven't finished their story. Well, I got to the point where the men came back to the Roman camp. We all hid and they went down into the pit by a rope. 
You saw them go down into that pit. Watch them swing down on the rope. They'll be gone by now. They won't. They're still there. How do you know? Because I pulled up their rope and took it away. They're still there waiting for you, Inspector. Good work. I must go at once. I'll let you know what happens. The inspector went out at a run. The police car roared away at top speed down the lane. Everyone agreed it was too exciting for words. They also agreed they were starving and had a magnificent meal. Just as they were finishing, the telephone rang. Julian went to answer it. He came back looking thrilled. That was the inspector. They've got them both and the woman. The inspector's very pleased with us, and so Sir James too. Apparently, we're to get a reward. Very hush hush, though. There's to be something for each of us, and for Timmy too. Well, I can see what old Timmy ought to ask for: a new cardboard collar. He's scratching his ear to bits. Oh, Timmy! He scratched it so hard he's made it bad again. It's maddening. Now everyone will laugh at him again. Oh no, they won't. Cheer up, George. This adventure began with Timmy in a cardboard collar, and bless me if it hasn't ended with Timmy in a cardboard collar. Three cheers for old Timmy! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! <laughs> yes, three cheers for old Timmy. Get your ear well before the next adventure, Tim. You really can't wear a cardboard collar again. <laughs>